Philippians 4, 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. All right, could we just give a round of applause again to our preschool students? I really ought to just call the service right there, pray, and be done, right? Was it John Wayne who said, never work with animals or kids? Why? Because animals are unpredictable. Kids are both unpredictable and cute. Did you hear the comment? It's awfully bright up here. Yes, it is. I feel that. I've been saying that for years. Hey, listen, I am uh, so excited that we get to have preschool families with us today. I got to go down just a bit ago and have a conversation with moms and dads. Welcome you well, I hope. Uh, I hope you do feel welcomed. We love having you join us for worship here today at Venture. God is doing some cool things in our church, and our preschool is one of those things. I'm so grateful that you're with us today. You should know uh, that we have, as a church family, been journeying together through a book of the Bible. We started doing this right after the calendar year turned over. The title of the series is Chasing Joy, this idea in the book of Philippians 16 times. The Apostle Paul is writing to a church in a Roman colony called Philippi, 16 times he says either joy or rejoice. We're chasing joy together, walking line by line, verse by verse through this book in Philippians. You should know as our guest today that there's actually a Bible underneath the seat in front of you. It's a paperback Bible. You're welcome to pull that out if you want to join me. I'm on page 1181 of that particular Bible. I'm in Philippians today. We're in chapter 4. We're looking at two short verses together. There's a ton of meaning to unpack from those two verses. This past week, I, uh, I had a moment, series of moments, where I thought about, some of you are wondering, why in the world does he have a level up here? I was yesterday with my wife and her side of the family. I've been married into that family now for 29 years. They're mine as well, my family. My mother-in-law's birthday was yesterday, 75 years old. You only get to celebrate that once. That's incredible. What a fun time together as a family. And I couldn't help but think, I think this phrase is actually an original. I, I looked it up. I can't find it anywhere online. I think this is originally from my father-in-law. You know a man is on the level when his bubble is in the middle. I think that's a reference to love handles, maybe a beer belly. I'm not sure. You know a man is on the level when his bubble is in the middle. That's the second time this week I thought about a level. The first time, I was having a difficult conversation with a contractor at our new house. We've been remodeling this house. House was built in 1980. It still has some of the original wallpaper and shag carpet. Welcome back to the age of jive. We've been doing some work on this together. I say we. We've got some contractors that are in there doing the heavy lifting, but every once in a while I come in and just mess stuff up for them, <laughs> including I was having this difficult conversation with one of the contractors. His name is Chris. I love this guy. I'm getting to know him. He's a, he's a, he's a great guy. I started hanging the mantle. I got distracted a few weeks ago. He finished the job. I went back later kind of checking the work, and I discovered it wasn't level. And I pointed it out to him. I was a little bit frustrated. I was kind, but I was making my intentions clear. He had this kind of puzzled look on his face, and he let it go. It says a lot about his character. I don't know what it says about mine, but I didn't let it go. I brought it back, oh, a day or two later, and I said, hey, I, I'm thinking about it. I think I do want to reset that mantle. He said, you know what? I've been thinking about that, and it's been bugging me. Let me go out to my truck. I'll be right back. Let me grab a six-foot level. Let's double check. He put his level up. You see where this is going? I've got a picture. This is his level. This is my level. Moments apart. 
would you believe I've been remodeling this house with a broken level? <laughs> if you want to zoom in a little bit on this particular level, you might notice that this direction, it kind of looks level, but if you spin it this way, oh no, that should read, there should be, oh boy, not good. Now, I don't know. I don't want to throw a brand name under the bus, but let me just say this wasn't the most expensive level that I've ever purchased. This is a problem if you know anything about construction. I really ought to just throw it away. I will. That can cause me trouble in the future. The title of today's message is Thinking and Doing. There's a leveling action that needs to happen inside of the Christian life. You know, a man's on the level when his bubble is in the middle, thinking and doing. If we get one out of balance, well, there could be an issue. This is why I think Paul leans into this idea well. The big idea from today's message is good thinking should lead to good doing. It doesn't always work that way. So I don't know about you, but I suspect you're wired one way or the other. Would today be an opportunity to shore up, to shim up one side or the other, maybe both, thinking, doing. Here's the text if you want to read it along with me. I'm in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, four chapters, finally, brothers. Now, you'll notice in good preacher fashion, he uses the word finally, but he goes on to write a whole good chunk of the fourth chapter. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true... Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, that is a long line of good words, is it not? We should unpack those words. If there's anything worthy of praise, hmm, what do you do with this? Keep reading. Think about these things. Oh, we're thinking and doing. Think about these things. That phrase, think about these things, I want to unpack that. What does that really mean here in just a minute? What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. That sounds a little bit cocky, actually, at first blush. Practice these things, Paul says. But if you're just joining us today, you should know that there's a whole lot of context that goes into that. The Apostle Paul has been pouring out his heart for almost four full chapters at this point. He shared some incredible, intense strategies that he's brought to following Jesus. And he's saying, listen, I want you to follow me as I follow Christ. Not just thinking, doing why? And the God of peace will be with you. If you were here last week, you perhaps remember this immediately follows a whole strategy about anxiety. If you find yourself feeling anxious, lean into peace. This is a follow-up to last week's message as well. There's an action step here, there. Can you see the contrast between thinking and doing? That phrase, think about these things. That's where I want to start. We're going to start with thinking as you think about your level. You know, a man's on the level when his bubble is in the middle. I want you to think about thinking first. Think about these things. And what I want to do, if you'll allow me, I want to make a case for Christian meditation. I think that's what this phrase means. Meditation? Some of you react to that word probably the way I often react to that word. What are you talking about here? What is this meditation thing? Do I have to chant? Do I have to wear, like, dreadlocks? What's going on here? No. Let me point this out to you. You could, uh, let, me, let me just briefly explain Bible translation. There's a misconception that our Bibles today come from a weird, like a weird game of Telephone. You ever play that game where you whisper to somebody and they whisper to somebody and you get down to the end and it's nothing like where you started? That's not the way Bible translation works. 
Some of us think that we have the text today because it started in Hebrew, got translated to Greek, and then got translated from that to Latin, from that to maybe German, from that to maybe some other language, and now they take that and they translate it into English today. That's not how it works. Bible translators, the ones that are anything worth their salt, they start with the original text. They start with the original language. But you know as well as I do, especially if you're a parent, that language shifts. My kids use words every once in a while. It's no, wait a minute, what does that mean today? That's not what it meant when I was your age. Language shifts. So Bible translators, even when they start with the original language, they're faced with a choice. Am I going with a literal translation or am I going with a translation where I'm trying to make it fit with the local idioms today, use the vernacular of today? Let me show you some of the ways you could translate the verse we just read. Here's the amplified version. It says, think continually. Think continually. Process these things always. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. That's a pretty good translation of what's happening here. The NASB, which, by the way, the New American Standard Bible, that's a very literal translation if you're looking for a literal translation of the text. The word they use there is dwell. Dwell on these things. That gives you some insight, doesn't it? Especially coming out of last week when we talked about anxiety. Sometimes we tend to dwell on the wrong things. Paul is saying, now dwell, meditate on these things. For my money, I like this word. Here's the N. K-J-V, meditate on these things. When you think about these things, actually, I want you to go deep with your thinking. Meditate. The idea of meditation is all through your Bible. Let me just show you a couple of places where you could find it. You could go all the way back to the beginning of the story. Genesis chapter 24, Isaac medita or meditated rather in the field as in southern Indiana, as they would say, of an evening. Look at this. Genesis chapter 24, he went out to the field one evening to meditate. And as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Joshua, if you look just a little bit further in the story, he's charged by God to meditate day and night. He's getting ready to lead God's people into the promised land. Moses has received the law from God. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And God is telling this new leader on the edge of the promised land, he's saying, hey, don't let this book of the law the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Don't let it depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Psalm 1 uh, talks about a blessed man. Look at this. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. God's word. He delights in God's word. And on his law, he meditates day and night. David became wiser than his teachers through meditation. You can see this in Psalm 119 if you'd like to. He says, I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I dwell on them. I ruminate on them. I let them roll around in my brain all the time. 1 Timothy chapter 4 Paul commands Timothy to meditate on these things. What things? The things he's just been teaching him for four chapters, this young pastor. Meditate on these. Think on these things. Process them. Bring them back into your mind. Let them roll around there. Some questions probably come to mind when you think about meditation. If you're like me, it would be what, why, and how. Let me quickly unpack those. Let's talk about what Christian meditation is. All of this is in the category of Thinking, good thinking, should lead to good doing. A man, you know, he's on the level when his bubble is in the middle. We're talking about thinking right now. Well, let's ask the question, well, what is biblical meditation? Can I start first with what it's not? It's not this idea, if you've heard it maybe from Hinduism or Buddhism or maybe transcendental meditation where the goal is to empty your mind. That's not what it is. Eastern meditation perhaps could be defined as emptying your mind. Meditation in the Bible as we read the text together, Christian meditation is filling your mind with the things of God. 
what are those things? Well, if you're taking notes, you might want to write a few of these down. These come straight out of God's word. How about God himself? Fill your mind with the Lord himself. Look at Psalm 63, which says very clearly, on my bed, I remember you. I think of you even through the watches of the night, all night long when the clock sounds off or the alarm clock goes off or I hear a noise in the night. I think of you processing who you are. Who am I in response to who you are? How about this? You could meditate on his wonderful works, what he does. Psalm 77 says, I will meditate on all your works. I'll consider all of your mighty deeds. I see not just who you are, God, but what you do in my life. And I I think about these things. I dwell on these things. I process these things. His revealed word, what he has shown to be true about himself. Psalm 119 says, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. So when the Apostle Paul says meditate on these things, can I remind you of what those things are? The text said very clearly, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, what is of good report? What are you thinking about today? What are you even right now in this moment? What are you filling your mind with? Does it look like this? He also says things that are of any virtue. Is that what you're filling your mind with? Things that are praiseworthy. I've told this story a few times, but some of you today might be your first time here. I'm so grateful you're with us. You should know that part of my story, part of why I am who I am today, is because my mom passed away my senior year of high school. She died, she had cancer, and she had struggled with cancer for a long time. My senior year of high school, three days before my birthday, we buried my mom on my 17th birthday. It was in the middle of that grief, I received a card in the mail from somebody in my church family. And inside the card, there was a silver uh, keychain. And uh, I think it was made out of pewter or, I, I don't know, some kind of a soft metal. I, w- I kept it on my keychain for a while. And then it wore itself out and that clasp broke. And then I kept it either in my pocket or in my wallet for a while. By the way, if you ever think, should I reach out to somebody that is walking through grief? Should I seek to encourage them even with something simple as a card? The answer is yes. That little keychain had a verse on it. Let me show you the verse. This is Isaiah chapter 40. It simply asks a series of good questions. And I found myself, even as a 17-year-old man, pulling that out, young man, every once in a while, and just reading through it and thinking about, who is God? Who am I in relationship to God? What am I feeling? What am I processing right now? Like a cow chewing his cud, I found myself meditating on this passage of Scripture. I would wish this experience on anyone. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. There's a lifetime of meditation that you could sink into those few short words right there. Let's keep reading. He gives strength to the weary. I needed that in that moment, those moments that became days, that became weeks, that became months, and now years later, and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. I've thought about that a lot. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Every time I see a bird soaring. I think about this verse. I saw an eagle, a bald eagle, fly over our house just a few weeks ago, and this is the verse that popped into my mind. And it reminded me, who is God? Who am I in relationship to him? Let's keep thinking about thinking. That's what meditation is, biblical meditation, filling my mind up with the things of God. Let me ask the question, why? Why should I meditate? Well, we just talked about it. There's joy and strength. 
where meditation becomes a source from that. I pulled some joy. I pulled a lot of strength from that Bible verse during that season of my life. Transformation. This is another reason why I should meditate. By the way, this is the goal of a Christian, to become more like Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says this very clearly. Our goal is to be transformed, conformed to the likeness of his Son. And just a few chapters later, look at Romans chapter 12. Look at this. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is how you worship God. Do not conform to the pattern of this world any longer, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right thinking. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Colossians chapter 3 says this, Since you have been raised with God, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. I read about a um, study conducted by Stanford University not long ago. Here's another reason why you should meditate. It becomes replacement therapy. Replacement therapy. Stanford University research team revealed that what we watch does have an effect on our imaginations, on our learning patterns, and on our behaviors. First, we're exposed to new behaviors. By the way, I'm pulling this as a quote from a book and characters. Next, we learn or acquire these new behaviors. The last and most crucial step is that we adopt these behaviors as our own. One of the most critical aspects of human development moms and dads, are you hearing this? That we need to understand is the influence of repeated viewing and repeated verbalizing in shaping our future. Look at this quote straight out of the book I just quoted. The information goes in harmlessly, almost unnoticed on a daily basis. But we don't react to it until later when we aren't able to realize the basis for our reactions. In other words, our value system is being formed whether we want it to or not, without any conscious awareness on our part of what is happening. Look at a few pages before this. This author says this, you are what you watch and think, coming out of that Stanford research study. Then he said this, by the way, this is only like 12 years old, I feel this language is even a little bit dated already 12 years later. If a 60-second commercial by repeated viewing can sell us a product, then isn't it possible for a 60-minute soap opera or smutcom by repeated viewing to sell us a lifestyle? Are soap operas even a thing anymore? I don't know. But I do know what is. You catch yourself doom-scrolling sometimes, garbage in, Garbage out. You are what you watch and think. Why should I meditate? Well, maybe it's replacement therapy. What? Why? Let's briefly focus on how, shall we? This one is pretty simple. First of all, the first step to proper meditation, right thinking, is to be selective in what you watch and what you read. My goodness, you ever do that thing where your phone tells you how many hours this week you invested. Oh, that is discouraging every time I see that. Here's a strategy. Maybe instead make your Bible your primary focus for meditation. Remember Psalm 1 verse 2 said, but his delight, this man who is following God, this blessed man, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So read it. Read the Bible contemplatively every day. Our elder team, the leaders here at Venture, we got to do a retreat together last weekend. It was glorious. The sunshine was awesome outside. Basically, we sat around the campfire for like 24 hours together. This is what a bunch of men do together. And we dreamed about what God is doing here at Venture and where he's taking us in the future. It was an awesome time together. And in the middle of one of these conversations, I don't even remember exactly what we were talking about, but one of our elders piped up and said, hey, what if I replaced doom scrolling? That 
Stanford research study we just read about that happened actually before the dude at Facebook invented that infinity scrolling thing. And now every social media platform has it. What if I replaced doom scrolling simply with reading my Bible? Would I be happier? Would I be healthier? Would I be closer to Jesus? Maybe. Probably. Here's a strategy. Read it with your Bible, with a prayer in your heart. Do you read the Bible and not just receive it, but then have a conversation back with God? Here's an idea. As you read your Bible, check this out. Occasionally, read it out loud to yourself. That text we just read, Psalm 1, verse 2, that word literally means, and on his law he meditates day and night, that literally means to mutter to say it out loud. Some of us, we're not just visual learners, but we're auditory learners as well. There's some value there. As you read, you might ask yourself a whole series of questions. Let me just put all of those up there on the screen. As I read, is there some truth that I should know from this verse? Is God speaking truth to me to replace some space where my thinking is a little bit off level? Is my level broken? God, would you reshape the way I view the world through your word? How does this passage affect maybe a previously held conviction? I've thought about it this way, but God, you're changing the way I view things. Be open to that. Is there something I should stop doing in light of this verse? Start doing, stop doing. Is there a practice that I should change? Is there a habit maybe that I ought to begin? Here's the idea of meditation. It's literally to hold the word of God in your heart until it has affected every part of your life. Are you doing that? There's a great action step there. Psalm 119, verse 14, we find David praying, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. If my level is off, If I'm thinking the wrong ways, God, correct my thinking. You know, a man's on the level when his bubble is in the middle. Good thinking, we said, leads to good doing. So could we transition to that? Could we seek the land of the plain with the right action steps? Paul says we're doing this so that we can embrace the God of peace. That phrase, the God of peace, we find that phrase early and often in the Pauline epistles, the letters that Paul writes. Like in Romans chapter 15, he says, and now the God of peace will be with you all. Romans chapter 16, he says, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 says, and the God of love and peace will be with you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and now the God of peace himself will sanctify you completely. Hebrews chapter 13 says, and may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, and he goes on to give them some encouragement. Finally, brothers, whatever is true in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things, right thinking. And then he says, what you have learned and what you've received and heard and seen in me, do them. Stop just thinking, stop just saying, but put them into practice. Oh, and by the way, in the God of peace, will be with you. Things that have been learned from Paul, things that have been received from Paul, things that have been heard about Paul, things that they've gotten to eyewitness and they were seen in Paul. So can we talk about four ways that we could put practically action steps around doing. Here's one. We pull this from the text. Feeling. If today's your first day here, you should know that there has been a long lead up, an on-ramp to this. As you read the book of Philippians, you see that it is filled 
with heart language, Paul's concern for his church family. He feels deeply for them. He pours out his heart to them. It's expressed all through Philippians. Actually, just a couple of weeks ago, we spent significant time talking about a couple of gals named Yodia and Syntyche. By the way, moms and dads, if you're expecting and you're looking for baby names, can I suggest those are a couple of great options right there. Yodia and Syntyche were bickering. And Paul's concern for them, his feeling toward them and the health of the emotional health of the church at large, he couldn't just sweep it under the rug. He had to call it out, speak the truth in love. Let's deal with this. We find elsewhere his concern for church family members. Like in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says this, Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I don't feel weak with them? Who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly burn? I feel deeply. Do you? As you think about right thinking, right doing, what do you feel for people around you? What do you feel even right now, today in this moment, for your church family members? Is there an action step surrounding that? Something that maybe the Holy Spirit would whisper in your ear even right now, you know, I should call so-and-so. I should find a little gadget to drop into a handwritten card and mail to to a hurting 17-year-old boy. Would that encourage him? Yeah, it might. Do you feel that? Does it move you to action? How about this? Doing, there's feeling. There's also seeking. Paul is constantly, as you read this letter, he's striving for perfection. Oh, my goodness. We just read this a few weeks ago. Could I remind you of Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, when he says, Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect. By the way, he recognizes that he's a fallen individual. Perfection is not inside of his grasp, but that doesn't stop him from trying. He keeps saying, but I press on to make it my own. Why? Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider what I, that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's using a running metaphor to describe his life, chasing after the things of Jesus, doing the right things. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26 says, Therefore I do not run like a man, running aimlessly. I do not fight. He's switching the metaphor. He's going from running to boxing. I do not fight like a man beating the air. There's, in other words, there's always room for improvement. I don't want to be disqualified in the race that I'm running or the fight that I'm fighting. I want to do this well For Jesus, verse 27, he goes on and says, No, I beat my body and I make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I want to practice what I preach, what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, need to match. Feeling, seeking, seeing, our vision statement here at Venture. You heard Jake say it a bit ago. We seek Jesus. We see you. We desperately want to see one another well, be moved to action, treat one another like a healthy church family. Philippians chapter 2, verse 17, he says he's willing to offer himself up as a martyr if it would help those around him. He's willing to do this as an act of worship before his God. Look at this in Ephesians, or Philippians chapter 2. He says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering, the sacrificial offering, check this out, of your faith. If that would help you out, I'm willing to do that for you. That is a high bar. We seek Jesus. We see you. That's a high bar to clear He goes to extremes, by the way. Look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I love this phrase. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. This is the goal. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Why? Because I seek Jesus and I see them to win those who are under the law. To those 
not having the law, I became like one not having the law, although I'm free from God's law, I'm not under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. He goes on to say this, to the weak I become weak, to all things, to all men I become all possible means I might win some. I do this for the sake of the gospel. I seek to see people where they're at and meet them where they're at. If you read through 2 Corinthians, you can see the extremes that Paul goes to. I'd point you to chapter 11. Oh my goodness, he gets shipwrecked. He gets beat up. He gets left for dead. Why? He's seeking Jesus. He wants to see other people where they're at and to meet them where they're at and to tell them about the life-changing message that has transformed who he is. It's not just right thinking. It's right doing as well. We've got feeling, we've got seeking, we've got seeing. Last but definitely not least, we have living. Let me ask it this way. Are you smoking what you're selling? Are you doing what you say you're going to do? What the world cannot tolerate is a group of Christians who say one thing and do another? Are we practicing what we're preaching? This is a high call to action, and I'm guessing that there's space right here in this moment for the Holy Spirit to do his thing and to whisper into your heart, maybe into your mind, you know, a man is on the level when his bubble is in the middle. Would there be a call to action right now? You know what a shim is, right? I've been playing with these at this house I've been working on. Maybe it's right thinking that needs shimmed up. Maybe it's right doing that needs shimmed up. Could I encourage you right now? I want to give you space as the worship team comes out. We've created space here in this room for movement. I would invite you to take a step. Move a step closer into right thinking. Maybe a step closer into right doing. We're going to sing a worship song, and we're going to create movement. We're going to create space in here. You might have noticed when you came in that we've got communion stations set up all over the room. You might have noticed that we've got a space over here even underneath the cross, and I want to encourage you to kind of choose your own adventure in this moment. You could simply stay right where you're at. Lean into right thinking. Is there something God would call you to transform your mind with today? Maybe just sit there and process that. Maybe there's a sin that needs confessed. Maybe there's something that you've struggled through this last week and you just want to spend some moments with your Savior. Go for it. If you've asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life, this is a great moment to move toward communion, to receive his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy. Maybe you walked in here today and you're carrying something and you want to release it. My friend Jake Smith, you met him earlier. He's going to be hanging out over here underneath the cross. He'd love nothing more than to encourage you by praying for you. If you, you know who I'm talking about. If I'm talking about you, during this moment of movement, you come over and just say, I'd like you to pray for me. Give him a sentence that tells him what he can pray for and he'll do that. He'll pray for you right here, right now. Good thinking, good doing. Here's space and margin to lean more and better into that. When you're ready, move. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. God, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this day. I thank you for your Bible that speaks truth to us. Not just then, but today. Even 2,000 years later, you speak truth through your words. And right now, we invite the Holy Spirit to whisper truth into our minds, into our hearts. Give us courage to move. It's in your name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.